Amen. Well, thank you, worship team. And uh, it's good to see all of you today. I know it's a weird week. It really is. Uh, maybe I'm the only one who feels that. But you know, we're out of routine. Some of us have eaten too much chocolate. Um, to be fair, people gave us that chocolate, and that's the right thing to do when someone gives you a gift. But, but we are feeling it. And uh, I would say in the midst of feeling all of that, uh, this morning we're coming to a passage that is a heavy passage, it just is. As I was preparing for this, uh, this this morning, I was up upstairs in my room and I was reading through the text and I was preaching through this sermon and it just struck me the, the weightiness of what we're turning to today. And so I just wanna prepare you and I wanna acknowledge the fact that we're all coming in feeling a little groggy, but I, I, I'm thankful that God, he has a plan for this morning, he has a plan for us and this is the, this is the word of the Lord that he's led us to for this day. We're in our final Sunday of Advent, and Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which means coming, and this is a time when we celebrate the comings of Christ, and I want to highlight the plural there, the comings of Christ, meaning we've been talking about the first coming, which is Christmas, Advent. Uh, That first coming is a glorious, joy-filled time, and I hope that that's come through over the course of this series. Uh, In that first coming, we've described it as a rescue mission, and that's what it was, Jesus came to us and he essentially kicked down the doors of our spiritual prison that we are living in. He made a way for people like you and me, lost people, broken people, sinful people, to be restored to our Heavenly Father. He made a way for us to be cleansed from our sin, to be forgiven, uh, to be made new and made righteous and made right. He made a way for us to live forever. And that door, brothers and sisters, is open. That door, visitors who maybe have not put your trust in Christ and and right now you're far from God and your sin is on you, uh, you need to hear this morning, as we hear the rest of this sermon, that door of salvation is still open today. John the Baptist declared, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. If, as I'm preaching today, at any moment, You could repent of your sin, confess it to God, say, God, I have sinned and I'm turning away, I'm sorry, and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin at any moment in this service and you will be saved. The door is open. But the second coming, the second coming is a time when that door is officially shut. And you need to know that this morning. The king who who came to us and was laid to rest in a manger, he's going to return to us as a mighty warrior riding on a battle horse with a robe dipped in blood. This is all described in Revelation. And he will judge the world with perfect, uncompromising justice. Every single word, every thought, every deed, every, every affection of our heart, every motivation will be laid bare before the perfect and righteous judge. And he will judge us for our sin. He's going to return. And so with this second advent, we are turning our attention now to the promise of the return of the king. That's what we're doing this morning. I titled the series Promise Keeper because Christmas is a powerful reminder that God keeps his word. we've, We've lit these candles and we've been pointing back to promises in the Old Testament and those promises were slow in coming. We talked about that a lot last week, didn't we? Many of those promises, they were made and then it was hundreds if not thousands of years before the fulfillment of that promise was realized. And so we look back to the manger and we say, wow, God, he keeps his promise even though sometimes his timeline is not our timeline. He keeps his promise and we've been celebrating that because again, that promise opened the door of salvation for the world, for people like us. But the same God who made those promises and kept those promises promised us this. I'm going to look at Matthew 24, and I'm going to read from verses 29 to 31. Jesus, he talked about his return, his second coming, and he described it this way. Just, I want you to sit in this. Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Our God promised that this second coming 
is coming. He promised that this day would come, and, and that day will be a day when the judgment is ushered in. Revelation 20 describes this judgment to us. I'm going to read again from Revelation 20. I'm going to read 11 to verse 15. Just try and imagine this scene in your mind. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away. No place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So in this second judgment, the great spiritual enemy that we have the enemy himself. The, remember we went back to Genesis and God promised to the serpent that a child would be born who would crush the serpent's head. Well, Jesus has crushed the serpent's head. He has, he has destroyed his authority to keep us bound in our sin. Right? So now there's, the doors are open. We're free. If we repent and believe, we can be set free. But still we see the effects of sin in the world. We feel the effects of sin. I was praying about wars all around the world. I was praying about death in our families and the, the effects of sin in our own lives. We still feel it. Something's not right. That's because our, our spiritual enemy, he is, he is still not yet thrown into that lake of fire. When he is, sin will be no more. Right? That is the day when God will perfectly, righteously, justly put sin and anyone who's carrying sin and holding on to sin, he will put them in the lake of fire and they will be removed from him and from creation forever. But the text goes on to say, after he throws our enemy into the lake of fire, he will throw all of those whose names are not written in the book of life into the lake of fire. Meaning everyone who has who's received this invitation to let go of their sin and lay hold of Jesus and live, everyone who has said, I'm not interested, I'm going to keep my sin, those people are going to be cast into the lake of fire with our spiritual enemy because they're carrying with them that same thing that destroyed the world. They are living in rebellion to our immortal, eternal God. And so they will be judged for their immortal, eternal rebellion forever. That's what the Bible says it is a sobering word. It's a sobering word. And the God who kept his promise in Bethlehem also promised that this day is coming. And so before we go any further, I want to just stop and ask a question for reflection. Do you believe this, Christian? Do you really believe it? And I don't mean, you know, do, do you give intellectual assent to this? You know, does this fit into your theological system? I mean, like, do, does this shape your heart, your mind, the way you live your life, that we actually believe that at any moment the king will return and that we'll answer to him and that our loved ones will answer to him and our neighbors will answer to him and this city will answer to him and this nation will answer to him and people around this world are going to answer to him. Do we believe that in, in the core of our being? Because if we do, it should change us. And that brings us to our passage for this morning. Jesus showed us how this reality ought to change us. He was very clear. And so this morning, we're covering a lot of ground. I'm going to read a lot of Bible because I want you to hear this from Jesus' mouth. Everything I'm reading this morning, these are the red letters. This is Jesus teaching his disciples. And after, after explaining to them that he is coming again to judge, he tells them this in verse 44. This is going to be kind of the, the center verse for everything that will follow today. Look with me at Matthew 24, verse 44. Jesus says, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Stop there. For the rest of this morning, we're going to read verse 45 all the way down to the end of chapter 25. So we're going to cover a lot of ground. I'm going to move very quickly, I promise. But everything that we're going to cover is Jesus' application of this truth. Jesus says, therefore, because I'm coming again to judge, there is a response 
that, that should arise in you. And he describes that response. I'm going to summarize it in one word, readiness. So Christian, as you think about your life, is that a word that would describe your life? Readiness. Maybe you're asking, well, I don't, I'm not sure. What would that even look like? Well, that's why Jesus goes on. He tells four parables that follow. Four parables, and each of these parables or stories describes what readiness looks like. So we're asking the question, and Jesus is going to answer it for us. How should we prepare for the return of the king? How should we prepare for the return of the king? Again, four parables. The first parable teaches us this lesson. If we would prepare for the return of the king, first we should obey the king's orders. We see this in verses 45 all the way down to 51. Hear now God's word. Jesus said, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that wicked servant says to himself, My master is delayed. And begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So in this first story that Jesus presents to us, it's actually it's pretty easy to understand. That's the point of parables. They're easy to understand. It's the, it's the responding and applying that's difficult. But the story itself is simple. He contrasts two servants. So first he says there's an obedient servant. The master goes away. He gives the servants instructions. And one of those servants does what the master said to do. He cares for the household. He cares for the people in the household that the master's entrusted to him. Provides for them. Meets their needs. And when the master returns and finds him being faithful, he rewards that servant. He blesses him. He entrusts him with more. But then Jesus contrasts that with the wicked servant. And the wicked servant convinces himself that because the master is delayed, I, I can kind of do what I want, can't I? And he gives himself liberty to disregard the commands of the master. I'm not going to do the things that he said. And instead, that servant takes the things that are entrusted to him, and rather than caring for those in the household, he gets himself drunk, he fills his face, he lives in rebellion, and the master returns at a time when they, the servants don't expect and the one who's been living in rebellion, it's, it says he's cut to pieces and he's cast out with the hypocrites. The other ones who pretended to love the master, but who actually didn't live the life that the master called them to live. So that's the parable. It's, it's very straightforward, but it, it does lead us to a challenging question. So as we apply the lesson, I want to ask you, are you obeying the king? A, a very simple question, isn't it? But it's a heavy one. Are you obeying the king? Is there something that you're doing that you know is wrong, but you've made peace with it, and you persist in it because you love it? Have you lulled yourself into a place of security where you say, I've got time, nobody knows, nobody knows about this thing, and I'm young, and I'm going to have some fun, and there will be a day when I'll turn away from this, but, but for the time being, I... I'm going to hang on to this. The New Testament is clear that there is no such thing as a Christian who makes peace with sin. Pretending that Jesus is your king, that he is your Lord, while also celebrating the things that he died for on the cross makes a person a hypocrite. And this passage reveals that God hates hypocrisy, hates it. Hypocrisy means wearing a mask. That's, it comes from that word. It's, it's a word that they would use in the dramatic world of the day. Putting on a mask, pretending that you're one thing, but in reality, you're something else. That's hypocrisy. The world thinks it's gross. The Bible says that God absolutely abhors hypocrisy. But that's what hypocrisy is. Elsewhere, Jesus asks, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Now, I want to be really clear because... There's room to mishear this today. Every single person in the room today is a sinner. Like we've all sinned. We've all fallen short. Each of us has sinned this week. I dare say, I think probably each of us has sinned this morning. 
things we have done, have not done, thoughts that have come into our minds, attitudes. So what Jesus is not doing in this parable is Jesus is not trying to take the, the faithful believer who loves him but yet who falls short. He's not trying to take that believer and crush them into a life of guilt and oppression. That's not what he's trying to do. What Jesus is doing is he's speaking to the believer who is pretending to be something that they're not and who thinks that, that that's okay. And he's, he's grabbing them by the collar and he's saying that it's not okay and the day is coming when you're gonna stand before the king and he sees through the whole charade, he sees through the mask and if you keep playing this game, you'll go to hell. That's what he's saying. So if that's you today, can I just remind you, the first advent kicked open the doors. You can be free from this. You could be free right now. If that's you and the spirit is convicting you, tune me up for the rest of the service. You've got something to deal with because he might return before my sermon's done, right? If that's you and you've got sin in your life and you're saying, why have I been playing with this? Why have I been living this? God, I want to let it go. I want to live for Jesus. You could do that right now because the door is open. Repent and believe and be saved. But Jesus is reminding us that the day is coming when the door will be shut. So obey the king. He's a good king. His ways are right. They lead to life. They lead to flourishing and joy. Don't settle for anything less. Don't settle for being half in, half out. Obey him. That's the first response if you want to be ready for the return of the king. It sets a tone for what's coming. Second, if you want to be ready for the return of the king, prepare for the king's delay. Prepare for the king's delay. That's what we see in Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. Look there with me. Jesus continues. And as, just as I go to read this, can I remind you, Jesus, when he gave this teaching, he was sitting down with his disciples. That's the context of this. So this isn't Jesus preaching out to the crowd. This is Jesus sitting down with, with men and women who would say, I'm all in. I'm a follower of Jesus. Jesus sits down with them and he does what we're doing right now. He says, let me just walk through what this looks like. So hear now the word of the Lord, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and they went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, but the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. And the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers, buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So here that Jesus is using familiar language for the disciples. It's maybe less familiar for us because weddings in that day and weddings in our day are different. A wedding in our day begins and ends in one day. So over a course of a few hours, you have a wedding and the party and it's done. But in that day, for some weddings, they could last for a whole week. This was, it, was a, it was a celebration that would go on for a long time, and it was a great honor to be a part of that celebration. And here, the, these virgins, their responsibility is to wait for the bridegroom. And as he comes to this big feast that's being thrown in the honor of he and his bride, they are to accompany him in with their lamps, and it's a, it's a way of honoring him, and they're a part of the processional. But the problem is, he lasted a long time. He, he didn't show up when they expected him. They all fell asleep. When they woke up, half of them realized we didn't even bring enough oil. We didn't think he'd be so long. And they weren't able to accompany him. So the ones who were ready accompanied him to the feast. And the ones who were not ready went and bought oil. And they thought, okay, now we're ready. And they came and and he said, it's too late. You, You missed it. Your responsibility was to accompany me, to honor me. You didn't. I don't know you. Get out. So that parable leads us to ask one probing question, which is this. What are you doing now to prepare your faith to endure to the end. What what are you using to fuel your faith for the delay? So if you're here and you're a Christian, then you can remember when you first became a Christian. 
And in those early days, didn't you feel like you could charge hell with a water pistol? You know, we, you first come to faith and you're just on top of the world. And you think, I'm never, gonna, I'm never gonna be afraid to tell anybody about Jesus. I'm never gonna have any doubts in my mind. Like I am 100% all in, but then five years passes and then 10 years pass and then 20 years pass. And the reality is that life hits you hard and you realize that you go through the hills and the valleys and the ups and the downs. Is this reality? Have you felt this? And so if Christ is returning tomorrow, then okay, I, I'm ready for Christ tomorrow. But what if he's returning in 10 years, 50 years? What am I doing today to prepare myself to be able to endure? Jesus says elsewhere, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Revelation uh, chapters 1 and 2, when he talks to the churches, that's what he tells me. He says, the one who endures to the end will be saved. Endurance. So how are you preparing yourself to endure? By way of illustration, I grew up in a movement, and this is not any knock on my church, my home church. I love my home church. I love my dad, who's the pastor of my home church. But the movement that I was a part of really played heavily to our emotions, especially for my age demographic. And everything was about making me feel a certain way. And when I felt a certain way, that was good. But when I wasn't feeling a certain way, that was bad. And so many emotions were pulled out of me at times when I'm trying to make me feel things and then strike while I'm feeling it. And and I would say that was actually very dangerous for me. It's part of the reason why, rightly or wrongly, I struggle now as an adult when we play music underneath our prayers. I struggle with that. I, I'm painfully slow processing with people through baptism. Not because emotions are bad or evil. Emotions are a gift from God. They're wonderful. But emotions are not the kind of thing that we want to build our foundations on. They're, they're a, a gift they can't be the foundation because they are fickle. They go up and down and all around. It's, it could be a mess if you build your life based on emotions. Meaning this, how does this apply to you? If you're here today and your whole faith walk is being sustained by an emotional high that you have on Sunday mornings, and, and you come and Sunday you have some kind of emotional experience and you hear the word preached, yeah, yes and amen, and then you go and you, you don't read your Bible and you're not thinking about God and you're just hoping that that emotional high will sustain you to the next Sunday and you get an emotional high, I just want you to hear from me loud and clear. That fuel will not sustain you through the long haul. It won't do it. It just won't do it. You need more than that in your spiritual life. God has given you more than that. He's given you Gifts, he's given you tools. The greatest gift he's given you, of course, is his Holy Spirit. But where does the Spirit, what does the Spirit use to change us? One of the primary gifts that the Spirit uses to change us is the Word of God. And I keep banging the drum, you know, get a reading plan, get into the Word of God. I'm, I'm not doing that because I want to be legalistic. I don't get any extra bonus points if, if you know, more of you read through the Bible in a year. I don't. I want you to read the Word of God because you need this in your life. Who wrote the Bible? Holy men who were taught by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God wields the, the word of God like a sword and he cuts out the things in our lives that need to change and he molds us. And as we meet him here, he changes us. And if you're riding those emotional highs, can I tell you, that's what's happening on a Sunday morning. The, the word is going forth, we're singing it, we're reading it, and the Spirit is taking that and pressing it into your life and changing you. That feeling that you're getting, that's coming from God using these tools to change you. You don't need to wait for next Sunday for that to happen. Come back to this place. It, is, it doesn't change. And keep seeking him and seeking him. And seek him in prayer. That's another fuel that you need to add to your life. Just learn the discipline of, of seeking him, of, of just bowing down before him and asking you to meet you in your need. He'll meet you there. He will. Maybe this is the year you need to join a prayer group and just go to the prayer group and say, hey, a prayer is something that I've, I need to grow in. I don't, know, I don't even know where to begin. This would be a great year to start that. Or, and this is one of the fuels we often neglect, Christian friendship. The Bible says so much about brothers and sisters in Christ who know us well enough to see the areas where things are off and who love us enough to, to point at them and say, hey, what, what's happening here? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You need this fuel. You need to prepare yourself for the long delay. The king might return tomorrow, but he might delay for another 50, 500 years. Therefore, we need to prepare for the king's delay. That's the second thing we learn here. Third, if you want to be ready for the return of the king, steward the king's investments. You can read verses 14 to 30. For it will be like a man going on a journey 
who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I've made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, you have what is yours. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now the point of this story, again, is simple. That's the point. But let me just pull out some details that help us to understand, just in case you missed them. First of all, I want you to notice that the, the talents that they're stewarding, and that's money, it's a, it's a large sum of money. The money that they're stewarding is not their money. That's why they're stewarding it. To steward something means to take something that's not yours and to, you're entrusted with it and then you handle it on behalf of the one who owns it. It's not their money, it's the master's. That's, we need to understand that. And then second, I want to draw your attention to the fact that they don't all receive the same amount of money. It, we read very early on in the parable that each is entrusted with a certain amount based upon his abilities. And so one receives five, one receives two, and one receives one. We're not told what criteria the master used. We're just told that he knew this one could be trusted with five, this one with two, this one with one. And that leads us to two questions, which are really one question. So just as we apply this lesson, by way of application, what has God entrusted to you? And what are you doing with it? So again, they have different things that are entrusted to them. And I want you to notice they're judged for what they do with what they had. So God doesn't go to the one with two talents. The master doesn't go to the one with two talents and, and compare what he did to the one with five talents. Of course the one with five talents did more. He, so he doesn't judge him based on that. He judges him based on what he had. And this is very helpful because don't we often look at other people and compare ourselves to what he's doing or what she's doing? Or look, what, look at the gifts that she has or what he has. And Jesus says, no, don't play that game, okay? She's been given what she's been given, and he's been given what he's been given, but you've been given something, Christian. So if you can imagine, you've got your hands like this. Imagine when you stand before the king, you're going to stand with your hands like this. And my question for you is, what's in those hands? What did he give to you? What did he entrust to you? Maybe, maybe he gave you the ability to earn a tremendous amount of money. I mean, just think, I, by the way, I think that's actually true for every one of us in this room. He allowed you to be born into the most prosperous nation in the history of the world. He, he allowed you to be born with maybe particular skill sets and a work ethic and maybe, and maybe a family that taught you, whatever. He's allowed you to be born with the ability to earn a tremendous amount of money. Okay, what did you do with that gift? Or maybe you were born with, with wonderful gifts and abilities, abilities to encourage, abilities to teach, abilities to lead. And all of that's from him, and you're going to stand before him. What did you do with those gifts, those abilities to serve his people, to, to equip, to further his kingdom in the world? Everything that we have has been entrusted to us by him. Our time, our talents, our treasure, all of it. And when the king returns, Jesus is saying, we will all give a reckoning for what we did 
with what he entrusted to us. A man by the name of C.T. Studd was one of seven young men, along with Hudson Taylor, who maybe you've heard of. And uh, these young men left behind their comfortable, cozy lives studying at Cambridge to go spread the gospel in China. They were part of the China Inland Mission. And they didn't actually see a tremendous amount of success, but the work that they did laid a groundwork, and God has, is doing a tremendous work in China even now. But these young men left behind their comfortable, cozy lives, and they followed the call. Actually, after that, C.T. Studd was later called to Africa. So he spent his entire life living abroad, serving the king, and he wrote a poem that's become famous. And so some of you, you've never heard his name, but maybe you've heard his poem. I want to just read the last stanza of his poem. He wrote, Only one life which will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. He believed this. It shaped him. One life. And I, I know that feels probably silly. For some of the, I'm looking at a lot of young people in this room. Uh, even some of us you know, middle-aged folks in the room. We feel like we have so much time. The reality is we do, we do not have a lot of time. We have this one brief life serve our king, to demonstrate our love for him, to express that love for him by pouring ourselves out for his kingdom, to reach out to the the world that he shed his blood to save, to serve his people who he loves. One life, one life. Our life is for him, for his kingdom. And we've got this one life to pour ourselves out for him. Every other voice in the world is going to tell you that the things that you have are yours. Even as I say this, even mature Christians in this room, you're bristling at this, right? Because you worked hard for what you have. It's yours. Every other voice is going to tell you that. It's yours. It's your kingdom. Build it up. Do with it whatever you want. I just want to make sure this morning, while we're in this passage, is we've got Jesus' words in front of us, and we're thinking about his story, which we're living in, I want you to hear him loud and clear. Everything that you have is not yours. It's his. Every bit of it, every last drop of it, it's his. Well, I worked hard. Your work ethic is from him. The place you were born is from him. Your abilities to earn, they're from him. All of it. The health in your body that enables you to do anything, it's from him. Your time is his, and one day that time's gonna come to an end. And, and every other voice around you is saying, it's yours, it's yours, do your thing, do, it's all for you. And you just need to hear loud and clear that you will and I will stand before the king, and this idea that this is all mine, it, that's all gonna fall to the floor, and we're gonna stand before the king, and he's gonna say, okay, and he's gonna deal with the believer in, let's say, Africa, and he's gonna say, okay, I entrusted you with these two talents, what did you do? Amazing, wow, and then he's gonna turn to this group of us, this North American group who he's entrusted with so much, and I wanna make sure that we're ready on that day. I want to make sure that we're ready and we can say, you entrusted us with this and, and by God's grace, we have, we have laid it all out for you. And yeah, we were tempted to build our own kingdom. Oh, we were so tempted to build our own kingdom. Daily we wrestled with that, but, but we remembered that it's your kingdom and we gave our lives for you. I want us to be ready for that day. It's his. Remember that and live accordingly. Fourth and finally, If you want to be ready for the return of the king, love the king's family. This is where we come to a close. Look at verses 31 to 46. Jesus tells one last parable. I love that he lands on this parable. This is beautiful. When the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne and before him will be gathered all the nations and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Why? For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison. You came to me. 
Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not welcome me. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, you did not visit me. Then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And he will answer them saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. Now, this is a familiar parable, um, but it's commonly misunderstood. Sometimes we read this parable, and our first assumption is that he's talking about just generosity in general. Um, And I I would suggest to you this morning that that's actually not what this parable is about. I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to be generous in general. He does, and I think you could turn to the parable of the Good Samaritan, where he teaches us that we should be generous. Love your neighbor. Who's my neighbor? Whoever's in your sphere of influence that you can help, love your neighbor. So we could turn there to talk about that, but I don't think that's what he's talking about here because Jesus tells us it's not what he's talking about here. Look very closely at verse uh, 49 to 50. Nope, yes. No, look at verse 40. Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And with that, Jesus is narrowing in his focus here in this parable. This is about how we treat Jesus' family. And so we ask the question, well, who are Jesus' family? And he answers that in Matthew 12. Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so while we should be generous to everyone, and Jesus teaches that elsewhere, in this parable, as we're thinking about preparing for the end, Jesus is telling us that specifically when we stand before the king, the way that we loved his people, the way that we loved our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ is going to be on full display. And what we've done for them is what we've done for him. Meaning when you welcomed that lonely Christian into your home for a meal, you were welcoming Jesus in for a meal. And when you heard about that Christian who lost their job and who needs support and you come alongside and you support them, you're supporting Jesus and when we as a church scale back on our budget so that we can, we can distribute more to people in parts of the world who are in need, we're supporting Jesus. And when you as a family scale back on your own resources so that you can be ready to be generous to people in your congregation, you are loving Jesus. And when we pray for and plead for and weep for the persecuted church, we're praying for and pleading for and weeping for Jesus. David Platt says here, a heart that has truly trusted in Christ And a life that is truly longing for Christ will be consumed with serving men and women who are in Christ. And then Jesus turns to the one on his left and on the flip side he says, when you build a comfortable, cozy castle for yourself and silo yourself and ignore the needs of the people of God, you ignore me. And when you gossip and slander and tear down Fellow believers, you gossip and slander and tear down me. One of the things that strikes me in this passage, and we see it all over the New Testament, is how profoundly Jesus identifies with his church. I I hope that we can come to see this a little more clearly. Jesus identifies with his church. He, He uses language when he writes to the Corinthians about how we're the body of Christ. Christ is the head and we are the members, meaning we are, we are Christ. Like we are the body. Every one of us is believers. He uses the language of, of ownership. When he talks about the bride of Christ, this like jealous love that he has for the church. He loves his church. He loves his people, loves them, identifies with them, is fiercely jealous for them. And that them is us. And it's important that we see this. Imagine for a moment somebody goes out into the community and they come back to you and they say, did you know that there's a whole group over there and they're slandering you? They're saying terrible things about you. They say you're the worst. Well, that would, that would bother you, I suspect. 
But just imagine how bothered you'd be if they come back and they say, that whole group of people over there, they are slandering your wife. You should hear what they're saying about your wife. They say she's this, they say she's that. They're talking about stuff that she did last weekend. Everybody's spreading all these rumors about this stuff. They're slandering your children. You should hear what that group of people is saying about your kids. Oh man, They're, they just told me about all the mistakes that your kids make and they told us about how your kids are, are, are a, bunch of, a bunch of little punk, rotten kids, disobedient kids, a bunch of hypocrite kids. How often have we been those people in the community slandering his bride, slandering his kids? You're just like, well, the, the kids did those dumb things. Yeah, they did do those dumb things. Kids do dumb things, but they're his kids. We don't, I don't think we think seriously about this because Jesus says the day is coming when he will return and all of that is going to be pulled out into the light and all the good stuff too, like praise God, like all the times that we were generous towards our brothers and sisters in need and the times we built them up and encouraged them and the times when we restored and, and healed, all that's going to be there but also every word we've spoken in the dark, all of the all of the gossip, the slander, the unforgiveness, the bitterness, the, the stuff that plagues the church today, all that's going to be out there too. Live accordingly, Jesus says. If you want to be prepared for the return of the king, make the decision now to love his family. And so we're concluding this morning, and I want to just acknowledge that this sermon probably felt like a kick in the teeth. I felt that kick in the teeth myself in my study. It's interesting pastorally you, I have to live in these things and this was a weird one to live in on this particular week when again we're all in this groggy mess and materialism is everywhere and we're seeing like this the kingdoms that we're building the empires I'm, I'm looking around at my my life and my decisions and my time so I if you're feeling like a kick in the teeth I felt that too today and I'll be honest with you because I'm a because I'm a sinner and I've got my own flaws and faults I wanted to soften this so badly I, I went through and there were, I wanted to chop out a whole bunch of this stuff. I really did. Um, because I'm a, I struggle with the sin of people pleasing and it's wrong. And I was not looking forward to this moment of looking out and seeing you sitting under this. But I'll tell you this, this, this is from Jesus and it's not my job. And in fact, I dare not edit what he has said to try to make you think more highly of me. If you're feeling a kick in the teeth today, my, my sole prayer is that if you're feeling that kick, that you're feeling it from the Holy Spirit and not from me. It's not my desire today. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that there are some people in this room who need a dramatic wake-up call. I'm gonna hazard a guess that there are some people who came in today not realizing that you're the one who needs a dramatic wake-up call. Some people who have been wearing a mask for a very long time and who have become really comfortable in the mask and who are justifying the mask. And God is just revealing to you today that that is, you are not ready. That if the king were to return today, you would be cast outside. You're not ready. You're not in right relationship with him. And if that is you, then again, I just want to plead with you and remind you that the door is open. That if we repent, if we lay down that sin, if we confess it and say, God, thank you for exposing this in my life. It's wrong, it's sin, I repent of it, and I want to live for Jesus. It, it's clean. Like, you don't need to go and make penance. You don't need to go. and it, Like, you just, you turn away from that sin, put your trust in Jesus, and today could be a day of salvation. Maybe for someone who came in today thinking they've been saved for a very long time. But real faith, real saving faith changes us. Faith without works is dead, James explains. It changes us. The king is merciful, but his grace was given to lead us to repentance, which is why in 2 Peter 3, he reminds us, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but he's patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But then he goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. So this morning as we close, I want to leave you with the question, are you ready? Are you ready? And I want to give us just a moment to, to sit in this, to pray about this. I'm going to put up those four, remember, so these, 
we've just been walking through, I hope that you've been able to see very clearly that this is Jesus applying what he said back in verse 44. Remember, he, he said, I'm coming again, and there will be judgment. And then he said, here's what we do. Therefore, in verse 44, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then Jesus, who loves us and who knows us better than we know ourselves, went on to tell us four stories to say, here are some areas where you need to think about your readiness. And so we're going to put those up on the screen. And I just want to give you a moment to think about your readiness. Are, are you ready for the return of the King? By grace, filled with his spirit. Is there an area here where maybe you've been lulled into sleep, lulled into apathy, and you need to just surrender to him and ask for his help. I want to give you a chance to do that. And then in just a moment, I'm going to lead us in a prayer of repentance. Great God, we love you. And I thank you that you, you wound us so as to heal us. And you break us down so as to bind us up. Lord, I thank you that you speak a hard word to us because you will that none should perish. And Lord, that perhaps there are some people in the room today who, if they were to stand before you right now, they would be separated from you forever. But today you're extending your offer of grace, your offer of new life in Christ. Lord, today could be a day of repentance and salvation. And Lord, we ask for that in Jesus' name. My God, I ask for that. And Lord, we just consider these categories. So Lord, I pray for your people today who are struggling with obedience. Lord, would you forgive us for holding on to and harboring and celebrating the sin that Jesus died for? God, I pray that you would bring about a great spirit of repentance and contrition for things that we watch, things that we think, things that we say, Lord, that we have made peace with, and Lord, that do not honor you. I pray that you would root out the thoughts that are sinful, the sin sinful patterns of thinking, Lord, the pride and the arrogance that we think that we know better than others. We think that we're smarter. We think that we're holier. Lord, I pray that you'd root out that pride in us. Lord, I pray that you would root out the unforgiveness in us, that we look at others and we refuse to extend grace to them when you have given grace to us so freely. Lord, the way that we divide and, uh, Lord, and fracture your church, which you died to bind together, Lord, and we war with, with you. Lord, we just pray that you would bring about a great spirit of repentance in this place. Lord, we thank you that there's forgiveness if we confess our sins. Lord, I pray that you would convict those of us who are not preparing. Lord, who are, who are living a life that would not be described as a ready life, but a, a careless life, a reckless life. God, a, a, a life that is like the, those virgins that didn't bring enough oil. Lord, that we're trying to sustain ourselves off of temporary highs and emotions and Lord, and we're not digging deep. Lord, I pray that you would just bring about an urgency in us. Lord, would you do that work, I pray. God, I pray for those of us who are struggling in this area of stewardship. And Lord, we just want to confess today that if we are in Christ, then we live for your kingdom, not our kingdom. And Lord, I pray that you would help that principle to, to ring right down, Lord, to the way that we organize our budgets to the way that we organize our family calendar, Lord, to the way that we make plans for our future, Lord, to the way that we view ourselves and talk about ourselves and see our gifts and our abilities and the way that we utilize our time, God, I pray that you would just bring a great spirit of conviction. Lord, I pray that we would be a congregation filled with men and women who are living for your kingdom. And Lord, I, I just plead that when we stand before you, we would hear the well done, good and faithful sermon. And then, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love your people. God, I pray for that. I pray that you would root out the unforgiveness in us. 
God, I pray that you would bring great conviction for the gossip and the slander. Lord, I also pr- I pray against all of the wicked, evil things that can happen, Lord, by those who pretend to be yours. Lord, we see that the church is full of, of injustice. Lord, it's full of people who do vile things and they're not of us. Um, and Lord, and we, we pray that sin would be rooted out and that your name would not be defamed in our city and in our world. Uh, Lord, forgive us for the times that we fall short of this. And Lord, forgive us for the pictures that we've painted in the world of your bride and your children. Forgive us if we've contributed to that in any way. God, we need your help. And now, Lord, we confess these things and we thank you that by the power of your spirit, we can change. And we pray that you would help us to change. We thank you that the blood of Jesus washes over all of our sin. And so we're confessing it to you, God, and we're asking that you would help us to turn, Lord, and we thank you that as we confess our sin, you remove it from us. As far as the east is from the west, it is removed. So help us now to offer ourselves to you, Lord, and be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Worship team, would you lead us?